Hi everyone, today we're going to do an overview of electric circuits. We're going to talk about parts of a circuit, uh, current potential difference and resistance, and we're also going to talk a little bit about Ohm's law. So in the most general terms, current electricity is the flow of charged particles through a conductor. A conductor is any material that allows charged particles to flow. Now we know those charged particles happen to be electrons, but keep in mind, people didn't know this all the time. In fact, some of the early assumptions about circuits involve the flow of positive charges, which leads to some conventions that still hang around today. But as we go through today's note, we're going to keep in mind the fact that conductors allow electrons to flow freely, and that's a very important property of them. Every single electric circuit has three very, very basic musts if you want electrons to flow in that circuit. The first thing that need, they need is a source, some sort of source of electrical potential energy. It gets charges flowing. The next thing they need is a conductor, a path through which charged particles can flow. And finally, circuits need a load. They need some sort of device that converts electrical potential energy into some other form of energy. Think about a light bulb converting electrical potential energy to radiant energy, or a motor, which turns electrical potential energy into kinetic energy. An analogy you may remember from grade nine involves the water pump example. So in this example, the flow of water represents the flow of charges around a circuit. Now, the water pump itself is almost like a water elevator in this picture. This is giving the water some gravitational potential energy, just like the source of a circuit provides electrons with electric potential energy, allowing the electrons to flow. The conductor in this example is represented with a slide. If there were no slide, the water would drop straight down. The load, as the water falls, gravitational potential energy of the water gets converted to kinetic energy when this little water wheel moves. That's just what a load does in a circuit. It converts electrical potential energy into some other form of energy. The first definition we're gonna talk about is current. So the definition of current is the amount of electrical charge flowing through a fixed surface in a conductor per unit time. So let's assume this is a piece of our conductor, a cylindrical uh, bit of wire. And we're interested in knowing how much charge, Q, that's the variable for charge, can flow past a fixed surface area, which is like a cross-sectional slice, a cross-sectional area of this wire A, in a certain amount of time, delta T. Current is defined as I equals charge per unit time, Q divided by delta T. Current is measured in units of amperes, which are often just referred to as amps. An amp is represented as a capital A, that's the unit. And so an amp, based on this equation, is just one coulomb, which is the unit of charge, per second. Q is the amount of charge passing through the surface area A. Since the smallest unit of charge is the charge on one single electron, which we know has a magnitude of 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, we can also represent Q as the number of charges passing through a certain point times the charge per individual particle. Q equals NE. Here's an example. If 0.5 amps is flowing through a wire for one hour, how many electrons have traveled through the wire in that time? Well, writing down what we know, current I is equal to 0.5 amps, time is equal to one hour, and that's 3,600 seconds. Now we know the definition of current, I equals Q over delta T. We also know with our second equation, charge is just equal to the number of particles times the charge per particle, the elementary charge per particle. Subbing these two equations into each other, we get this. N is the number of charges, in this case electrons, passing through a unit surface area. E is our elementary charge, delta T is 3600 seconds, and the current we know is 0.5 amps, giving us 1.12 times 10 to the 22 electrons traveling through the wire in that amount of time. The next definition we're going to talk about is potential difference, which is often called voltage. So potential difference is the difference in electric potential energy 
per unit charge between any two points on a circuit. In order to really understand what that means, we're going to have another analogy going on. In this case, we're going to use an example that we're comfortable with, gravity and gravitational potential energy. So in the example on the left, I have a little mass, m, and a larger mass, m2. I can say that m, the little mass, has some gravitational potential energy in joules when I separate it from m2 by a certain distance r. If I were to release that little mass, m, it would be attracted through the force of gravity and travel towards m2. Now let's look at the example when it comes to charges. Let's say I have some larger charge, q2, and some little test charge, q, which is in red in this diagram, and I've separated them a certain distance, r. Well, I could just as easily say q, little q, has some electric potential energy in joules when it's separated from q2 by a distance r. Let's say when I let go, when I release little q, it will be attracted to q2, so it would actually move towards it, just like in our gravitational example. But, now that we've thought about that, what if we don't actually care about the magnitude of little m? What if we don't actually care about the magnitude of little q? What we're more interested in is the field strength of both of these fields at a certain distance r. Well, then in the case of my gravitational example, I would want to find the gravitational potential, which means the gravitational potential energy per unit mass at a distance r. Correspondingly, if I wanted the electric potential at a distance r, I would want to know what is the electric potential energy per unit charge q at a distance r. In this way I'm saying I don't really care what q is, I don't really care what little m is, I just want to know what effect would any charge have at this location? What effect would any mass have at this location? That's what we mean by potential. So potential difference is the difference in electric potential energy per unit charge between two points in a circuit. Another way of saying this, which means the same thing, it's also the work required per unit charge to move a charge between two points on a circuit. So we can say delta V, which is our symbol for the change in electric potential, is equal to the change in electric potential energy, delta E, divided by Q, which means per unit charge. We know work is just the change in energy, so we could just as easily say it's equal to the work to move that charge around, divided by Q, per unit charge. Potential difference is measured in units of volts. You've seen that before. This symbol for volts as a unit is capital V. Potential difference is often just referred to as a voltage also with symbol capital V. That's kind of a unique one. The variable for voltage is capital V, but that's also the symbol for the unit, volts. Note, this is often represented as capital V instead of delta V. So you can see potential difference or voltage written either way, as a capital V or as a delta V. So using these equations, we can say one volt is the electric potential difference between any two points on a circuit as long as it takes one joule of work per coulomb to move a positive charge from one point to the other in that circuit. Now, you may have heard people use the term voltage drop. When charges flow in a conductor, some people say the charge carriers lose energy as they move through circuit components. But you and I know that energy cannot be lost or destroyed, it's only converted from one form to another. And that's literally the point of a circuit, to convert energy from one form, electric potential energy, to another form. For example, when water falls down the water slide in our analogy, the water is transforming gravitational potential energy into another form of energy. However, as it goes down the slide, the gravitational potential energy drops. So as electrons travel around our circuit, the electric potential energy drops as it goes through a load. We're not losing energy. That energy is just be convert, being converted to a different form. So that decrease in electric potential energy is what is often referred to as a voltage drop. 
Now, if we rearrange the last equation ever so slightly, we can actually come up with an equation to calculate the work done in joules as current travels through some voltage drop. So delta E, or work done, is equal to Q delta V, delta V being our potential difference or voltage drop. We also know that Q is just equal to I times delta T. That was our original equation for current. Subbing these things in together, we can come up with this equation, which might come in handy. Hint, it will. Delta E equals work done, which is equal to the current I times delta T times our voltage drop, delta V. Now we're going to use this equation in an example. If the instrument panel on a spacecraft is connected to a 5 volt battery and uses 1450 joules of energy in 95 seconds, how much current did it draw? Well, let's first of all figure out what we're working with. 5 volts, that is our voltage, our potential difference, delta V. 1450 joules is the amount of energy that's being used. That's our work done, which is the same as our change in energy. 95 seconds is the time we're interested in, and we need to find the current. Using our equation, delta E equals I delta T times the voltage drop, substituting in some values and rearranging, we can easily figure out that the current on our instrument panel is just 3.1 amps. Next definition is resistance. Resistance refers to the opposition to charge flow in a conductor. The symbol for resistance is just capital R. And the unit for resistance is a special one. It's the omega symbol, which is a Greek symbol, and we just call it an ohm. Now, resistance in a circuit depends on a number of things, and these are all important uh, variables that will affect the resistance of various circuit components. The first thing that will affect the resistance of a circuit component is the material that it's made of. So the atomic structure of the material will affect how easily electrons will flow through it. The resistance per unit of the material is a property of the material called resistivity. Next up is the temperature. The temperature will actually affect the resistance of a material. And as you know, if you leave a circuit on for a while, it's going to heat up. That means the resistance of your circuit component will change as it heats up. Now, in order to visualize what's going on when a circuit component heats up, we're going to think of another analogy. In this analogy, we're going to think of a whole bunch of people trying to go through a crowded hallway. In this analogy, the people represent the electrons that are passing through this circuit component. In this hallway, however, there are a whole bunch of pylons. Those pylons represent the atomic structure, so the atoms, in our circuit component that the electrons have to get through. So ask yourself this, is it going to be easier for people to get through a hallway full of pylons when the pylons are stationary or when the pylons are moving around? Well, it's going to be way easier to get through when the pylons are stationary. Now think about a circuit component. What happens to the atoms in any material when you heat them up? They start moving around and they start vibrating. That's going to make it more difficult for electrons to pass through. So as you increase the temperature of a material, you increase the resistance of that material. The next thing you could do is you could increase the length of your circuit component. The longer the pathway through which electrons must travel, the more resistance. Next and last that we're going to discuss is the cross-sectional area. That means if you have a wire and you slice it down the middle, what is the area of that cut section? That's our cross-section. The thinner the wire, the more difficult it is for electrons to get through. The wider the wire, the easier it is for electrons to get through. Again, think of a hallway. You've got a whole bunch of people you need to get through a hallway. A wide hallway is going to make it easier than a narrow hallway. Here's a general expression that will relate resistance to the quantities we just discussed. R, resistance, is equal to rho, which represents the resistivity of the material, times L, the length of our circuit component, divided by A, which is the cross-sectional area. Rho, which is resistivity, is a material property of any substance, you can look it up in a table, is in units of ohms times meters, Length is in units of meters, and cross-sectional area is an area, so it's in meters squared. 
If we want to take measurements in a circuit, we're going to have to use something called a multimeter typically. Multimeters are multifunction. That means they can measure current, they can measure voltage, and they can measure resistance. However, when you're using an ammeter to measure current, a voltmeter to measure voltage, or an ohmmeter to measure resistance, how you connect them in the circuit is extremely important. When you're using an ammeter, the ammeter measures current, which means the current has to actually go through the ammeter. The ammeter has a very, very, very low re resistance, so it does not affect the current in your circuit. It's like it's not even there. You must connect the ammeter in series with the component that you're measuring. When you want to measure voltage, the opposite happens. For a voltmeter, no current should pass through it. A voltmeter has an effective, very, very, very high resistance. So in order to take a voltmeter measurement, you have to attach the voltmeter across the circuit component you want to measure. That's called in parallel. When you're measuring resistance, you must connect the ohmmeter the same way you connect a voltmeter, in parallel across the component that you want to measure. Here are some useful circuit symbols that you're going to need to be familiar with. Uh, when you're drawing circuit diagrams. Remember when you're drawing circuit diagrams, you want to make sure your circuit diagram is basically a rectangle. All of your wires need to be nice straight lines. You can have many branches, that's totally fine, but all of your wires have to be nice straight lines, no curvy wires. All of your circuit symbols need to be drawn like this. Do not shade them in, do not draw them as they look. They must be very basic components like shown in this table. Here are the most important ones you need to know. A wire is a straight line. A battery is a long line and a small line. If you have a single long line and small line, that's one single cell. If you have two or three or four, that means you have several batteries back to back. Switches come up a lot. Switches can be open or closed. You can draw them either way. Light bulbs typically look like a little filament with a circle around them. A resistor is a generic circuit component with some fixed resistance. Looks like kind of like a little lightning bolt. An ammeter is a capital A with a circle around it. A voltmeter is a capital V with a circle around it. This is a relationship you learn for the first time in grade 9. It's called Ohm's Law. When the voltage across a load with a constant resistance is varied, the current changes and is directly proportional to the voltage applied. So in this simple circuit, we're recording the voltage across a resistor, we have an ammeter recording the current, and the resistance is a constant. The relationship that will describe how voltage changes across the resistor as current changes is V equals I times R. So this actually gives us a bit of an appreciation for what an ohm means. One ohm is the electric resistance of a conductor that has a current of one amp through it when the potential difference across it is one volt. Back when current electricity was first being used, people didn't really know what an electron was, let alone that electrons were the things that traveled in a circuit. So they assumed it was actually positive charges that were the things flowing in a circuit. Obviously, this is wrong, and you can blame Benjamin Franklin for this. However, the convention stuck. And in fact, we still use that convention today. Assuming that positive charges are the things that are flowing in a circuit is typically referred to as conventional current. If we wanted to assume that electrons are the things that are flowing in a circuit and we actually wanted to track the motion of electrons in the wires around a circuit, we would call that electron flow. That's also done, but actually isn't as common as analyzing circuits using conventional current. So in this course, we actually will be using conventional current. I know it sounds weird, but it works because when we're analyzing circuits, it actually doesn't matter the direction we assume charges are moving because effectively it means the same thing. So if we assume conventional current, which we will, when we're looking at the direction of charge flow in a circuit, we're assuming positive charges are traveling from the positive end of a source. Let's take a look at the circuit symbol for a second. Notice how the long line on our source represents the positive end. The short line represents the negative end. So conventional current, we're following positive charges as they go from the positive side of our source all the way around our circuit 
to the negative side. If we assume electron flow, we're following negative charges as they go from the negative side of our source all the way around our circuit towards the positive side of our source. Effectively, like I said, it will lead to exactly the same results in our circuit analysis. However, conventional current is the one that many, many electronics courses, even at the university level, use, and that's what we're using. This year, as in grade nine, we are only gonna look at something called direct current, called DC. The type of current that's actually coming out of outlets in your house is called alternating current, AC. The difference is, in a circuit that involves direct current, Charges are flowing in only one direction continuously. In an alternating current circuit, the electrons go back and forth really, really, really fast. So we will talk about alternating current later on this unit as it applies to some electromagnetism. But when we're analyzing circuits, we will only be interested in direct current.